This On The Land special is proudly brought to you by New Zealand Wool Services. Greetings, I'm Rob Coke Williams and I'm talking to you at the moment because I want to put a face on depression and the will to end it all because it is too much to face. I also want to introduce you to some people who can describe how to recognise it, how to get on top of it, and how you can recover and become somebody who is leading a normal life again. It may not be you yourself, it could be somebody who's in your immediate family or somebody whom you are close to. But I can assure you that the first thing you've got to do, is like being an alcoholic, is you've got to understand in yourself that you've got a problem before you can start healing yourself. Here's my story. 15th of October, 2014. I'm driving down St John's Road in Christchurch. There's a very strong southerly wind and the trees, the big tall pine trees, are bending. And I put out to the universe a plea. I said, please can one of those trees blow over, land on my car and take me out. I hadn't wanted to commit suicide. I'd thought about it, I'd planned it, but I didn't want my family to have the stigma of their father or grandfather having committed suicide. But what I did, and what I realised I had been doing, was I was putting it out to the universe saying, please, a tree land on my roof of my car and take me out, because that's an accident, or a truck come through an intersection, a red light, take me out. An accident I could handle. Suicide, no. But what I hadn't realised is how deeply I was in trouble. So what is depression and how do we recognise it? Well, the physical symptoms are a corollary to some extent of stre chronic stress. So the person will show up with uh, gut trouble, they'll show up with um, poor appetite, they'll show up with low libido, uh, they'll show up with poor sleep, and then as it physically shows up in the body as pain, it is, it is what shows up with chronic use of musculature. So they'll have tight upper shoulders, they'll have the base of the skull here, the suboccipital muscles will often be tight, and quite commonly they'll have an intermittent low back pain that comes and goes. In fact, all these symptoms will come and go depending on their emotional state to some extent, the stresses that are on them. Depression, as we've heard, is a collection of symptoms. Um, occasionally, it can start very abruptly. Like occasionally, hear a story of a person saying, I woke up one morning and I was completely different to the day before. But by far the most common story is that people will be struggling over weeks, months, sometimes even years, with some symptoms until they get bad enough that they realise something is definitely wrong now. So quite commonly it does start with difficulty sleeping, not enjoying. People can carry on their normal activities, they can go on the farm, do all their normal things, but their wife's saying, why don't you come out tonight? No, I can't be bothered going out tonight. And it's often dropping off of all the extra events in life rather than your core work which people are often remarkably successful at continuing to do. But they'll also be finding it's harder to get up to go to work. The motivation's not there, they're not enjoying it in the way that they were. And this can take, as I said, weeks or months before it gets to the point of them really realising that something's definitely not right. The, the thing that brings someone into our practice or to go and see a GP or to seek some help in general is some way down the line from when, the, when things actually started to happen and part of what I would want to do with someone is kind of track that back because the issues may have started years ago. What you may have been seeing might just actually be part of what happened earlier on in someone's life without knowing what it is that they're trying to deal with, they're just going to try and cope with this in the best way that they possibly can. And what we often find is that 
when the tr people are trying to cope with something, they're using the strategies, but they stop working for them. And that's when they start to get into distress. The stress that they're experiencing is kind of outweighing how, the, how they're able to cope with this. And then they're st going to start feeling it. Um, what often happens then is that because we're feeling distress, we're going to try and find whatever ways that we can to reduce that distress. Um, in my practice, it's more, and I'm sure this reflects other psychologists and counsellors as well, it's not often, or it's more often the case that people are coming in wanting help to try and feel better rather than think better. So we're trying to, they're wanting to seek help to feel about how they feel. So, obviously as far as my story is concerned, I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. People were trying to work out why I was so busy that I wasn't answering my phone. Why I wasn't ringing them back. Even close friends and associates who would suggest that I would go to a meeting with them or that I would go to the hotel and have a quiet beer and a chat. There was always a reason or an excuse for me not to do it. In my heart, I was pleading for somebody to say, Rob, I think you should go to the doctor. Now, I've told you that I did go to the doctor, and what I didn't tell you was that when I did make that decision, a huge load came off my shoulders. The realisation, in fact, that when he went through the list of 11 points which indicate depression, I had nine of them. And he said any three is an alarm bell which is very, very bad. So why don't we want to talk about it? I think there's a number of reasons. And then this is, look, this is just my clinical experience. This is what I've noticed over the years. There's a number of reasons people don't talk about it. One of the most common ones is they don't recognise it. They don't actually realise that that's what's happening with them because it has quite an insidious onset often. It's just, it's a build up um, generated by the situation the person's in over a chronic period of time. And the other side of it is cultural. Um, and, and that cultural is, is different for men and for women, but the cultural component is, you know, we're the, we're the tough rugby racing beer country. Um, you know, the, our ideal man, the, the, the one we've been brought up as the bloke whose ideal is the Anzac, you know, this, this tough bloke who, holds it inside and just gets on with it and that sort of thing. So it's seen as, it's seen as a bit of a taboo sometimes to talk about it. But I would say that that, that cultural grip is loosening and people are a, a lot happier to talk about it than they were, say, when I first came into practice 30 years ago. Stigma around mental health is large. There's a lot of work that's been done to try and reduce that and a lot of campaigns to try and reduce that. But there's two sides to it. There's not only the public aspect of, of stigma around mental health issues or a, a whole range of issues in life, including, say, sexuality, but there's a self-stigma, which is, often comes in, that if I say something about this, then I'm going to be perceived in a negative way. You know, I don't like how I feel if this is happening to me. I'm the guy or girl or woman who, or whoever who copes with this stuff. And if I'm not coping, then there's something wrong with me. Well, I think all mental illness, there's been some stigma. People can perceive it as a weakness. You know, I'm a strong person. I can cope with stresses. I can cope with difficulties. But if it was just a response to stress, we probably wouldn't call it a medical condition. Sometimes it does happen in response to stress, but quite often it can happen for inadequate reasons. Now, that may partly because it runs in families and a whole variety of other factors can contribute to who develops depression and who doesn't develop depression. But I think it is that sense that I'm strong, I should be able to cope with everything myself, um, and, and a reluctance, I think, to seek help for something which can be vague at one level. Although usually people, I know something's wrong, I just don't know what it is that's wrong. I think at first people don't recognise it. They just sort of meet this resistance, like I don't want to talk about this, but they may not know exactly what it is. To be able to turn around and say, um, I'm experiencing some self-stigma around my mental health issues is actually something that's quite a high level thing to do. You, know, you have to be aware of what's going on. 
when someone's really struggling with something and they're in the middle of it, you could liken it to being like a tug of war, that they've got their hands on the rope fighting this thing, and that's where all of their energy and their focus is invested. It's not in taking a broader a, a perspective or awareness of what's going on in their life. So that makes it very hard to see aspects of, say, self-stigma at, at play around at that point. Um, we're just trying to do the best we can to almost stay alive in that situation. So with my life story, as far as depression is concerned, I've got to the stage where, yeah, I recognised it and I'm getting some treatment and I'm getting some help. The interesting thing is that I'm now talking about it very openly and I'm absolutely astounded how many people will say, yeah, I've been there. I've been in that dark area, I came through it because I went and got some help. So basically, how realistic is it as a, as a number? Is it huge? Depression is a reasonably common disorder. Over a lifetime, the estimates are at least 20, 30, possibly even 40% of people may have a time of depression at some stage in their life. It's not very common in children, um, but it becomes much more common during adolescence. Probably at any time in the population, three, four, five percent of people will be currently suffering from depression. Some evidence that Christchurch both earthquakes, it's a little bit higher than five percent. Um, and then there will be people clearly who have had depression, varying degrees of recovery from depression, because so often depression is it's a long-term condition rather than something just happens to you and you get over it. Often it takes quite a period of time to make a full recovery. Now, therapy is something which I always ignored or walked away from and said that I certainly wasn't going to go to any counsellor. I would scoff when the news would say that counselling was being administered to people who had been through some sort of a trauma. When I went to my doctor, he told me in no uncertain terms that if I was going to heal myself, I had to be realistic and to go to a counsellor. I did, and I can recommend that you, or anyone you know, takes it on the chin, depending, it doesn't matter what their views were, they need to learn to retrain or reprogram their mind, because that is what counsellors do. Basically, you are starting to heal yourself, because no one else can heal you apart from you. They can assist you, but they can't do it for you. I think it's important to, for people to, to really be open to looking for some help when it comes to dealing with problems. No matter what kind of sphere of life you look at, your people are willing to put up their hand to accept help with something that they don't know enough about to uh, be able to fix themselves, whether it's a, a plumbing issue or a, an electrical issue or a problem with their car, um, whether that's seeking some help on farm management or pasture management. We're kind of, in some spheres of life, we're happy to say, hey, I need a help, some help with this. When it comes to emotional or mental health, we're, re we're re really reluctant to do that. And that does come back to the stigma aspect. But if we looked at it in a way that says, here's just another aspect of my life that I'm going to get some expert help with, then we're uh, going to be more open to doing that. One of the things that really stops people from seeking help is the idea that they should know how to fix it themselves. I can fix every other damn thing in my life, why can't I fix this? And actually, the irony of that is it's sometimes those attempts to fix what's going on inside them as if it was a practical problem actually makes it worse. And that's where myself and my colleagues and, and other um, professionals come in to try and help someone to change how they're going about trying to fix it. You know, the skills are good, it's just unfortunately one of those situations where it just backfires. I think the first thing on recognising in yourself or a family member or uh, a w working colleague is to go along and see your general practitioner is the best step one. 
And I think even identifying it, getting a name for it, understanding what it is, can be helpful and may be sufficient for a few people. There's two main options for straightforward depression. One are one of the antidepressant drugs, the most commonly used in our community would probably be fluoxetine and citalopram, um, or one of the psychotherapies. And for first attempt at treatment, uh, there may not be much in it, but some people will have a much stronger preference for one, or maybe a bias. I don't want to take drugs, or bias against counsellors, and I think you can often go with that in the first instance for mild to moderate depression and try something. 30, 40, 50 percent of the time the first treatments that's tried will work. But if that doesn't work there's still a range of other options that continue to try. And I think that's where the GP is vital with coordinating. Is this person really improving to the extent that we would expect? I joke with my clients often and say, well, hey, you know, when they come and see me and they're sitting on the couch in front of me, I say, well, you know, I'm the last door on the right. You know, I'm the bit that someone, the person that someone comes to when they've tried everything else. Um, unfortunately, the, the situation also means that once someone does get to be sitting in front of somebody else talking about their problems, it's almost saying that, hey, unfortunately what you've been doing hasn't been working but that's not to say that the person's been working extraordinarily hard to try and sort out their situation fix themselves do whatever they can to get themselves out of this mess it's just that now it's time to get some help for that and it's hard to put your hand up coming into therapy counseling is launching into the unknown. There's uncertainty in there and we're going to be very careful around that. In fact, there's a lot of anxiety that comes with that. You know, who is this person? What are we going to talk about? If I'm feeling bad now, am I going to be feeling worse once I start to, you know, discuss the stuff and open up? Most people's experience though is that the old adage of a problem shared is a problem halved actually is true and as soon as we start to put our hand up to having an issue, um, to openly discussing what's going on, then there is that phenomena of other people coming along and saying, hey, I've been through that as well. My story is similar to you. When people do that in a very, very public way, it kind of draws people out who are attracted to that, to, who want to be able to share um, their experience and that can be the start of that person getting some help for what's going on as well. I think it's also important because quite often people come in and the doctor says, are you feeling better? And they say, yeah, I'm feeling much better, thank you. That's the beginning of the conversation, not the end of the conversation, because people say, I'm feeling better than when I was really bad. Actually, I'm not feeling better right, I'm just feeling better than when I was at my worst. And if you don't carry on the conversation, so I think it's often useful to ask, so if you put yourself on one to 10 and 10's your old normal self, where would you be? Oh, I'm only three out of 10, but I'm much better than I was, and I'm grateful for being better than I was. But I think that's an indication the treatments are only working in part, and one may need to rethink if it's an antidepressant, the dose, or should you change antidepressant, or have you had the right sort of therapy, should it be a combination, um, and there's a series of options which are available for people over time. Depression to me is very much like a drought. It sneaks up on you, and even though the green grass may look as though it's looking great, it's very, very short, and there's nothing there for your stock to eat. Let me put it this way. During the major earthquake in February, we lost, or I lost, 16 of my workmates. And I went through obvious huge amounts of grief. I came out the other side, I thought. It had been very, very hard. I was sobbing a lot, I wasn't eating, I wasn't sleeping, I didn't want to know anybody. But I sort of got through it, I thought. But I hadn't. The interesting thing was that I was kidding myself that I was okay. 
I was turning a blind eye to the fact that I would walk out of my studio, for example, climb into my car, burst into tears and drive aimlessly around Christchurch because I felt absolutely useless. I felt as though I was worthless. I was just going through the motions of life. And that was why I wanted a tree to land on my car or a truck to take me out. It certainly can sneak up. And again, whereas some people, you know, maybe a third, the first treatment we try works really well. And inside the month, people say, I'm so much better, I'm nearly back to my old self. But probably for two thirds, there's some ongoing symptoms, you've got to refine the treatment, you've got to think again as to how do we really get this person back to their old self rather than just accept being better than bad. Absolutely it seems to sneak up on us. The, there's, if we go back to what I said before around um, the, often the issues start a long time before it becomes a problem. As we start to struggle, we're going to start using whatever ways we can to deal with this, to cope with this. That can often mean, you know, the social withdrawal, pulling back on things. And when we pull back on things, we often pull back on really important aspects of life. Um, human beings are social animals, and that's where we've, we seek out contact generally as a first port of call to get um, some safety and some comfort in our life. Uh, so when you think, you know, I'm not going to, I don't want to face the stuff I want to deal with, they're going to see that there's something wrong with me, that my little secret is going to get revealed, and I don't want that. What tends to happen is we start to kind of wind up our coping strategies, do more of the things that aren't working for us in, a, in an attempt um, to try and sort out our situations, and that makes sense because no one's going to say, hey, I'm really struggling right now, I'm going to just put down the things that really have worked for me in other times in my life and pick up the stuff over here. And we'll just take what has worked for us and try to do more of it. More social withdrawal, more drinking, more sleeping longer than is ne than, than needed, getting busy in other things, trying to occupy ourselves, eating unhealthily. These are the things that sort of start to show up in people's lives when we start to struggle with things. Nutrition is important because we are made up of components of vitamins and minerals and fats and proteins and often when you're depressed um, you don't have an appetite to eat so it's equally you know very very important to try and whilst you might not have an appetite just try and eat some good food because food is important for creating and you know the, the byproduct or the starting products of your neurotransmitters and there's whilst depression can't be diagnosed through a blood test we can do some blood tests that can recognize if there are vitamin d um, issues are there zinc issues are there magnesium issues are there b vitamin issues so i'd firstly be looking at getting a, a diet that's you know just a basic way of eating we've become quite complicated with how we eat with processed foods, if you look at what's in a processed food, it's incredibly complicated. It's a, there's a lot of chemicals in there. You want to get back to basics, like how your grandmother ate, with good protein sources, good fat sources, vegetables, salads, and fruits, just to get you know a good rounded balance of those basic macro and micronutrients in. If the lifestyle's not working, absolutely. But it's based on the context. Um, at times in our life, whatever lifestyle we have is um, it works fine. But when we change situations in our life, if we increase the stress and, stress and pressures in our life, how we've been living may not may stop working. And if, at, at that point, we do need to to look at what we can do differently. Um, if we've been working really long hours or we've been under a lot of pressure. There needs to be some aspects of like focusing on making sure we get enough sleep so that we don't get fatigued because that can often be the thing that will start to push um, our tolerances and our ability to deal with what life is throwing at us over the, over the, the edge. Um, it's more about, I think, maintaining good lifestyle habits and the sort of big four that I focus on with people are diet, sleep, exercise and doing things that are meaningful and having meaningful interactions in 
one's life. And if we all did that, then we're all probably going to be better off for it. We, we need a holiday because it, it takes you out of that fight-flight response. It, it, it allows that body, your body to go back into, into a more relaxed state. And, and, and that means that the pressure is not on the systems that are, that are, are now under strain and therefore the, the body can recover. It has an innate capacity to heal itself, providing the pressures aren't on it. Now, every once in a while, a bit of pharmacological assistance helps, you know, in the form of medications. Um, and, and sometimes if a person can't take a holiday or can't take a break or can't change the situation, that's the only way to hold things together. Uh, I guess from our perspective in the, in the natural healing game, we would argue the best thing is to try and change the triggers. And a holiday is part of that process. It's getting out there and, and it's also reconnecting with family and friends and the things you like to do and taking you away from the things that are actually tipping you up. So as far as I'm concerned, there's several points that I'd like to it's really stressed now. Firstly, you're going to hide it from everybody. Secondly, you aren't going to talk about it. You're going to go within yourself. And thirdly, you can really only heal yourself, but first you've got to admit that you're in trouble. I did all three. I hid it. I didn't talk about it, but I did go and get some help. And I can assure you that life is very, very worth going and getting that help. And now, finally, a quick word from John Dawson from New Zealand Wool Services, who made all this possible. We're very pleased to be able to do a very small thing to enable um, a greater awareness of depression. Personally, I think um, depression's very misunderstood in today's life. And if we can do something to help people understand it more, that's great. So I just hope that you enjoy the program and take a lot from it. Thank you very much.